Uh, maybe Manas, do you want to share your screen? Yes, can you see my screen filter now? Uh, yes. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, so okay, I, as I said before, uh, Professor Kibakis will uh, from the University of Michigan will talk about uh, phone assisted uh, uh, quantum processes, and then uh, uh, you know you have one hour, uh, mm -hmm. so the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Feliciano. Uh, I would like to present uh, how the APW code implements the theory to, to perform phone assisted optical process calculations. So my name is uh, Manos Kipakis from the University of Michigan and um, the Department of Science and Engineering. And, and uh, my, my group has been developing in this space uh, for, for quite some time. So, so let me tell you why exactly we need optics. And we'll start with the case of silicon, the simplest material with an indirect band gap. So what you see here is the band structure of silicon. We see here the valence bands, the empty conduction bands. And so we're considering optical transitions from an occupied state to an empty state. Now, if we remember, photons in this scale give us um, energy, but they don't give us much momentum. So in this diagram, you would see a vertical transition, right? Energy comes from the photon, but not much momentum. So the momentum of the electron remains pretty much the same in this direct optical transition. And, and, and so when we go to experiment, we find very good agreement, as you see in this figure. Now, let me comment on this figure, because that is something that you will learn in this school. To get the correct agreement experiment, first of all, we need to correct the band gap of the FTD, band gap underestimation, right? As you see, the direct band gap of silicon is at about three and a half EV. You will not get this if you just run a Corm Espresso with one of the local functionals, such as LDA or PBE. To get the correct band gap, you need to use a method like the GW method. And then you will find the dashed line results here that shows that indeed the absorption onset matches the experiment. However, as you see, you do match the onset, but you won't be able to match the peak heights and uh, the relative amplitudes. So in order to do that, you also need to use one more technique that you learn in this school. Uh, you need to invoke excitonic effects as implemented in the petzal peter equation method. And with those excitonic effects, you'll be able to get much better agreement with the experimental data. Um, not only that, but if you go uh, one more step, you can also factor in the broadening of these peaks coming from temperature. That was the work by Marini in 2008. So as you see, if you account for the zero point motion or the motion as a function of temperature, you can also explain the spectra of silicon also at various temperatures. So and a remarkable achievement that now we have temperature dependent spectra in amazing agreement with experiment. However, as you see, all of this happens for direct absorption. And this occurs at energies which are above the direct band gap at three and a half EV. Though, as we know, though, silicon has an indirect band gap with a value of 1.1 1.2 electron volts. And that's, why, and that's what enables silicon to absorb in the visible, all right? So in order to get absorption across the indirect band gap, you need extra momentum. You need the assistance from phonons. So in this picture, as you see here, an electron on top of the valence band absorbs energy from the photon and gets scattered by an electron coupling in order to make a transition across the intrinsic band gap that changes both its energy and its momentum. Again, and throughout the visible spectrum, you do need those phonons to enable absorption, right? And that's what allows silicon solar cells to operate. Uh, silicon solar cells are the most widely deployed solar cell technology. And if you are buying a solar cell for your house, you are most likely buying a silicon solar cell. And it, silicon absolutely needs phonons to operate in solar cell applications. Without phonons, as Feliciano mentioned, silicon would have been transparent. If the atoms could not oscillate, light would just pass through the visible light would pass through silicon and, and, and it would appear the same as, as glass. All right, so, so in order to explain this uh, very important process in, in, in many technological applications, we need to account for phonons in addition to photons. All right, so before we start talking about phone assisted optics, let's do a quick refresher of the laws of optics, right? So we need, uh, when you describe the optical properties of a medium, we need to invoke the refractive index and, and an example give us the laws of refraction like Snell's laws you see here. But we also need to account for the loss of like is propagates the material and that is the absorption. So when you shine a laser, towards the material, what we see is that um, light as it propagates in an absorbing medium, it attenuates. 
And the law is called the Beer Lambert law. There's an exponential decay of the light beam the further it penetrates into the medium. And the characteristic decay coefficient alpha is what we call the absorption coefficient. Its units have to be the opposite of length um, in order to get a dimensionless exponent here. So if you invert the absorption coefficient, you get the penetration depth. How deeply does light penetrate into the material before it gets completely absorbed? And when we talk about a material that is a strong absorber, a, a direct, um, a direct allowed band gap, you get coefficients on the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 uh, inverse centimeters. So the absorption happens within the scale uh, of at most 100 nanometers or to 1 micron. Um, all right, so how do we evaluate those coefficients, right? If, we don't, if you want to, to describe both refraction and absorption, we need to invoke the complex indices, the complex refractive index and the complex electric function. Again, the real part of these coefficients denotes refraction, the propagation of light, and the imaginary part denotes absorption, the loss of light. The two of those are connected to each other. We can go from epsilon, epsilon two to N and kappa through these sets of equations. And, and once you have the refractive index, you can take, go one more step and you can invoke the refractive index and you can obtain the absorption coefficient in units that can be measured experimentally in inverse centimeter minus one. Uh, your, or other things you need is the frequency of the light and the speed of light in, in vacuum. All right. so. Now, let's for a second forget about quantum mechanics and discuss uh, classical physics, right? So how does light get absorbed in a classical material that is in a free electron gas? So in, in the classical sense, light is an oscillating electromagnetic field. So in order to describe the motion of electrons under the influence of the oscillating electromagnetic field, you need to apply the Drude model. So the mass time acceleration is equal to the force by the field minus this empirical term for scattering which acts as friction, friction, and that dissipates the energy in the material. So the energy of the field eventually turns into heat through the photons. Um, this equation, if you apply the static limit, if you set temperature, the time equal to zero, you get the equation for the DC conductivity, the well-known equation that um, describes how the conductivity of a metal is related to the scattering time and vice versa. And, and um, Samuel Ponset discussed this in yesterday's lecture as well. Now, if you apply the same equation, but now if you set your field to be time-dependent and you look at the time-dependent loss caused by scattering, you will find the absorption coefficient of a metal. And again, the, um, the result depends on the density of electrons, the frequency of light, the mass of the electron, and the scattering time tau. And you can use this equation and you can fit it to the data for metals and you'll be able to obtain parameters for tau that may, be, that may be able to explain the experimental spectra of metals. However, this tau you obtain that way will be phenomenological, right? And it won't be predictive in explaining what goes on in the material. So our goal here is to, to explain how exactly absorption happens and what happens to the light and its energy once it gets absorbed. All right, so when it comes to a proper theory of optical absorption, we need to invoke uh, the bands. We need to invoke the states and wave functions of electrons in the material. Okay, so, so first let's look at direct absorption. And because it's a one-step process, we're going to treat it with first order perturbation theory. So we start with our unperturbed states, which are the DFT wave functions that or the GW wave function. So after we, uh, it can be DFT wave functions combined with GW eigenvalues to give us the correct band gap. Getting the correct band gap is important to get the correct onset of absorption. And then we want to see how would the electrons in these states uh, respond to an oscillating electromagnetic field. That is the field coming from a photon. So the Hamiltonian describes the interaction of electrons with photons is given by this term charge of the electron, mass of the electron, speed of light, times the vector potential of the photons, times the momentum operator. And if you combine the mass, you can find that this is the velocity operator, the same velocity operator that Samuel discussed yesterday in the context of transport. Um, and so how do we find the recombination probability or the absorption probability? The transition rate is the uh, from Fermi's golden rule. The rate, the probability rate, a unique time of transition from state i to state f to pi over h bar times the electron photon matrix elements between state, the initial and the final state, 
times the delta function to conserve energy that gives us a density of states. So in the case of electrons in a, uh, in a material, say an electron in the valence band that absorbs a photon to go to the conduction band, the initial state is the electron plus the photon in the valence band. The final state is therefore now in the conduction band, state J. And we, uh, we can plug them in and find the transition rate. The total power that goes into the material will then be the rate of this transition from occupied to empty states times the energy of the photon coming in. And if we also take into account the incident power, the, cam the power coming in from the photons, once we divide the two, we can find the absorption coefficient, right? That is the energy absorbed per unit volume uh, divided by the incident energy, right? So by plugging this equation, we arrive at an equation that includes familiar atomistic level quantities, like the energies of our electrons in the band structure, the velocity matrix elements, now these are the interband velocity matrix elements, the occupation states going from occupied to empty states, and some prefactors that are material parameters. Okay, the dielectric function, um, we can get the imaginary part by inverting the equation for the absorption coefficient. And you can derive again a similar equation that involves delta function and matrix elements. You can also obtain the real part by using the kremers kroninger relation or the imaginary part and that becomes a sum over all bands. You don't have the delta function here, so you need to sum over, in principle, over all your bands up to very high energies uh, of this equation. Now, his, uh, the delta function became an energy denominator. But with these two equations, you can find epsilon and epsilon two, and you have all the optical properties of, of your material. Now, what happens when we have the phonons, right? Now, the phonons come in the picture. So now we have two perturbations. We have the electron-photon interaction and the electron-phonon interaction. And in order to, to deal with two, two perturbic Hamiltonians, we need to go to second-order perturbation theory. So now our transition rate is given again by 2 pi h bar, the delta function to conserve energy between the initial and final states. Energy, of course, is conserved. And the matrix element now becomes a more generalized matrix element that involves a sum over intermediate states. And we need um, Hamiltonian matrix elements to those intermediate states and as well as their energies. Now remember, Hamiltonian is a sum of two parts, the electron photon and the electron photon Hamiltonian. And if we don't describe phonon assisted absorption of photons, we need to keep only the cross terms because the other two terms correspond either to two photon absorption or two phonon absorption or emission. So this is not the, the science we want to, to explore. And so by keeping all the cross terms, we find that you know, the sum breaks into two terms where you have first the electron photon Hamiltonian followed by electron photon Hamiltonian, or the other way around where electron photon happens first followed by electron photon interactions. And so there are two possible ways to, to get the absorption that corresponds to the two paths you see in this diagram. All right, so how do we now evaluate the absorption coefficient? So in order to get the imaginary part of the electric function, we get again a series of, of prefactors, uh, a sum over bands, and a double integral over the Brillouin zone. We need double integral because we need to account for the initial state of the electron and the final state of the electron, right? We have a matrix element, which I will discuss in a minute. We have an occupation factor to ensure that we go from occupied states to empty states. And last, we have a delta function to conserve energy. That is the energy of the initial state of the electron plus the energy of the photon plus or minus the energy of the photon is equal to the final energy of the electron. Uh, as you see, there are two paths that correspond to the two possible ways to rearrange the electron photon and electron photon Hamiltonians. So either you put G first, that is the electron photon matrix element, or you put the velocity matrix element um, first, depending on the two, the two possible uh, um, permutations. The occupation factor accounts for the fact that we need to transition from an occupied to an empty state by either emitting or absorbing a phonon. And then we need to subtract the inverse process so to, to, you know, in order to get to the net transition rate. And this beta that you see here is the fact that it's plus one or minus one, depending on whether you are investigating the phonon emission process or the phonon absorption process. And of course, for a, 
experimental situation, both of these effects are taking place at any given temperature. And so you have to, um, to, to sum both contributions to get the, the total absorption. And the last step is to, to go from the imaginary epsilon to the absorption coefficient through this uh, transformation, through this simple equation. Right. And last but not least, this vector here corresponds to the light polarization. Um, so it's in the paper called lambda earlier. Uh, that, that, that is the polarization of the, of the incident light. All right, so as you see, we saw earlier that direct optical absorption is, is well known, right? You see some very beautiful results that account for band gap corrections, for excitonic effects, and for temperature. So what is the challenge with the phonon assistic term? The challenge is that this double sum becomes very expensive. Uh, in direct absorption, we only need to consider vertical transitions. So we have only a single sum over the green zone, which can be further reduced to the irreducible wedge. So we need to sum only one set of K coordinates and then a set of bands. But if it, the sum becomes double, we have to account for every possible electron in the blue zone uh, and every possible unoccupied in the blue zone. And as an example here, I'm giving you the results for silicon. So if you want to get the spectra of silicon with a resolution of 30 milli electron volts, that means that you need to sample the blue zone with a grid that is 24 by 24 by 24. And that corresponds to about 200 million combinations of initial and final states. And, and that is a lot, even for large computers today, this is a very large number of combinations to calculate the electron phonon coupling matrix elements and the optical transitions. And the solution, as you'll hear throughout this school, is to interpolate those quantities using the technique of maximally localized when your functions. Um, so we switch from the block basis to the one year basis, and that allows us to interpolate quantities that depend on a single uh, K index, a single uh, wave vector index, such as the quasi particle energies, as well as the optical matrix elements, as, uh, as Feliciano Justino and Samuel Ponsen discussed yesterday. Uh, but the key quantity, really, uh, that is, uh, makes this result transformative is the ability to interpolate the electron phonon matrix element, which is the most time consuming and, and more challenging uh, part in the calculations. You know, so we have all the quantities we want in a fine uh, enough grids, then it's a, a one step process to, to sum the, all the contributions and obtain the coefficients. All right. So, before I show you results, let me take a small side step to discuss how do experimentalists know whether a material has a direct band gap or an indirect band gap? And the answer is they do the so called, they perform what they call the, the Tauk plot. So, what is a Tauk plot? They use the following equations. We know analytically that if your material has a direct allowed band gap, then the absorption coefficient will be proportional to the, uh, the energy difference between your photon and the direct band gap to the one half power, the square root. So it will raise, rise like a square root function from the band gap. And the equation also involves an omega in the denominator. So if you move omega to the other side and square the whole thing, you should get a term that is linear with respect to the photon energy. So if you plot this quantity as a function of the photon energy, you should get a straight line. Uh, however, if your bank is indirect, then the exponent in this equation should be a square that comes from the density of states for needed for indirect absorption. So again, if you move omega to the other side, but now raised to the one half power, you get a straight line that intersects the x axis at the indirect band gap. And so here's an example of experimental data for a tin selenide, that's a material with an indirect band gap. And on one axis, they take the absorption multiplied by frequency raised to the one half power, that's what you get for indirect absorption. And the intercept on this axis gives you the indirect band gap. While if they raise the square, that's the, data, the same data plot on the uh, uh, this manipulation. If you follow the straight line here, you find the direct band gap. But that's how you can tell whether the material has an indirect or a direct band gap, um, and depending on which of these equations best resembles a straight line. All right. And also, uh, because you can have plus or minus the phonon frequency, you get two different onsets for the indirect band gap that corresponds to phonon emission or phonon absorption. <clears throat> 
So with that, let's see what the data look like for silicon. So again, these are the data obtained for silicon close to the band gap. Remember the band gap of silicon is about 1.1 to 1.2 EV, depending on temperature. And if you take the absorption coefficient, multiply by the photon energy raised to the one half power, as we expect, we should get a straight line with an intercept that is the indirect band gap. And that's what we also see as a function of temperature, right? Uh, we see a straight line that is approximately independent of temperature that corresponds to the uh, phonon emission term. Phonon emission is always possible even at very low temperatures. That's what enable absorption even at very low temperatures. On the other hand, we also have the phonon absorption term that uh, becomes stronger and stronger as temperature increases. And as you see, if we account for the slight discrepancy between the bang up we get from theory to what we have experimentally, uh, as well as the temperature dependence, we can have overall very good agreement between the theoretical and the experimental spectra near the onset of absorption of silicon. Um, now, you, can, you, you could be able to obtain this data if you find uh, the typical metrics elements involved in these transitions and the density of states, but truly the power of the formalism comes in when we look at transitions throughout the Brin zone. That is, when we look, want to look at absorption, um, not so close to the band gap, but really uh, at much higher energies that correspond to the, the visible, because now you have transitions uh, throughout the brain zone. And again, if you account for a small shift uh, to match the onset of the experiments, we see that we get a very good agreement of experiment over an order of over a range of several orders of magnitude with experimental data, and that allows us that, that enables us to to calculate the optical spectra of indirect band gap materials, including silicon, including the most important semiconductor and the most important solar cell material uh, commercially. Um, there are of course many other materials that do have indirect band gaps. And I'm going to show you two examples here. That is the work of Kyle Bushik and Xiao Zhang, who will be helping you later today with a hands-on portion of the workshop. So uh, Carl has looked at the properties of boron arsenide. It is a 3,5 compound, and it's become very popular recently because of theoretical predictions and validation that it has an ultra high thermal conductivity. It is the second best thermal conductor, second only to diamond. And so uh, Carl performed calculations with the GW method and found that the indirect band gap should be 2.05 EV. And he further calculated the optical absorption spectra uh, and as you see here, this is the absorption ac across the indirect band gap. And here's the experimental data from the group of Professor Gangchen at MIT. Uh, again, this is the zero of the third experimental data. As you see, the onset and the slope matches excellently with the calculations that uh, Kyle predicted. Another family of materials within the band gaps is silicon carbide. Silicon, silicon carbide resembles silicon a lot, except it's a compound material with one silicon and one carbon atom. And it is famous for occurring in various polytypes. There is the, the cubic sil silicon carbide that resembles cubic silicon, um, but also it has many hexagonal polytypes that vary in the order of the stacking sequence of the hexagonal planes. Um, and these are called 3C, 2H, 4H, 6H, depending on the period along the C-axis of the repetition pattern. And because of this stacking sequence variations, uh, you get different band gaps for each of these polytypes, depending on how the bands are folded. And he did the calculation for those various polytypes uh, and found that he was able to explain not only the band gap, but also the onset of the absorption uh, spectra and found a very good agreement with experimental studies. Now, I mentioned to you that in order to get optical absorption in a material, the photon energy needs to be above the band gap. Now, this is true as long as the material is not doped. And here's a case, like in the case of silicon, right? So if the photon does not have enough energy to excite an electron from the valence of the conduction band, it shouldn't be absorbed, should be transparent. However, if the material is doped, then those free electrons, for example, can absorb the energy. And there are many ways they can absorb the energy. And the simplest one is a direct transition from the lowest to the next conduction band, as you see here, denoted with a direct term. 
You can also have a photon assist transitions where you have energy given by the photon and momentum given by the photon that allows absorption even when you don't have a vertical band at, at, at a specific energy. It enables the absorption at any photon energy along this band. And last but not least, we can also think of electrons as free electrons that undergo collisions, the theory that Samuel Ponson described yesterday. And so as the electrons oscillate in the response co collectively, as in, in response to the oscillating electromagnetic field, they collide with the phonons, the energy is transferred to the phonons where eventually becomes heat. So that acts as another source of loss for a photon energy, for a photon going through your material. So you may be wondering which of them dominates. And the answer is all of them are important. So what we see here is the absorption coefficient of silicon, but now we'll look at photon energies in the infrared. Now to give the energy, remember this is the band gap, we are looking at energies below the band gap. So in undoped silicon, the absorption you see here should have been zero. But this is silicon that has a number of free electrons, 10 to the 19. And if you see, we do see here the direct absorption uh, at an energy of, of about 0 0.5 EV that you see here, corresponding to this vertical transition. Uh, we do see phonon assisted effects, the, the red line, and we also see the resistive term. Uh, scattering by impurities, we found that it is not a very, uh, not as strong as the other three. And if you stop them all together, you see this um, shape that resembles, uh, uh, that has this shoulder feature at the energy caused by the, uh, by the direct transition. If you look at the similar situation for holes, you see that the spectra are featureless. And at first sight, you see if it's featureless, that means that only one mechanism is important. But if you look more closely, you see that all of these three mechanisms, that the phonon assisted, the resistive, and also the direct transition between these two valence bands is also important. And we some, need something together. And if you do some all terms together in plot inverse experiment, you see that we also find excellent agreement with data that are uh, decades old. So you see here as a function of doping and wavelength, we find an excellent agreement with the data that comes from experiment, uh, both for the electrons and for the holes. So now this formula that we, that, uh, that we have developed can also be applied to study the optical spectra of doped semiconductors uh, that can be a potential source of loss in solar cells on in lasers. And I'll, I'll give you some examples later today. Um, and one of the specific example where this uh, loss by free carriers is important is in the so-called transparent conducting oxides. A famous transparent conducting oxide is tin dioxide. Tin dioxide has a band gap of 3.5 EV. So typically, uh, typically that would be insulating and transparent. Uh, however, the reason we like thin oxide is because we can dope it with electrons and those electrons can make it conduct. So this material can be simultaneously a conductor and transparent. And we, when we like this as a top contact in electronic devices that allows us to, to close the circuit without blocking the absorption or emission of light, such as solar cells, in LEDs, in displays, et cetera. And again, in this case, we see uh, visible light can be absorbed across the gap because the gap is too wide. Visible light cannot be absorbed vertically because there are no bands for the electrons to go to. But if you put a phonon, then you can have phonon assist absorption uh, within the same band, an intraband absorption process. And that poses a fundamental transparency limit uh, by these free carriers. They give you conductivity, but they also limit the transparency. And so because this, the, the carrier concentration in this material can be controlled by doping, the absorption coefficient will be proportional to the number of free carriers. And the, uh, the proportionality factor is the absorption cross-section. And what you see here is we plot the absorption cross-section as a function of the photon wavelength for two light polarizations, whether you are along the C-axis of the material or perpendicular to it within the plane. And uh, in both cases, you see a very smooth spectrum that keeps increasing as you go to longer wavelengths and, and takes uh, minimum values near the visible. And if you'd like to learn more about applications of these techniques to transparent conducting oxides, I can point out you these references where you can find out more about the methodology as well as the implications uh, for practical materials.
And another case where absorption uh, mediated by phonons matters is for laser diodes. Uh, laser diodes such as Blu-ray lasers uh, or semiconductor lasers uh, involve dope materials, involve light, so that's a source of loss. The reason we were interested in those lasers is because they can be used for communication, for projectors, for optical storage, um, and many other applications where lasers are, are needed to, to be compact, efficient, and fast. Um, and here's a quick picture of how you use such a laser. Um, as with semiconductors, you need to involve topaz, an N-type region, a P-type region, and then region in between where the light emission happens, connected by a voltage source. So what does the battery do? It, it takes an electron from the valence band from the P-type region and gives it energy to put it in the conduction band of the N-type region. Um, the electrons the holes, of course, see the energy landscape and they fall into the so-called quantum well, made with a material that has a narrower band gap than the surrounding regions. So the electron falls into the quantum well, gets trapped, the hole like a bubble raises to the top of the valence band, the quantum well. And now this electron and this hole can see each other, they can recombine and they give you light. This light though has to cross the surrounding doped region. So again, we have a situation where light can be absorbed by free carriers. And so this is important when it comes to lasers because in lasers, light has to spend quite some time in the device to get amplified. Now, this is an example of a laser that has uh, NMP type lasers that also need to form a waveguide to confine the photons. So when you have a waveguide, you can think of light being bouncing back and forth many times in the laser to get amplification. When light travels the material, it can get absorbed this way, right? As, as photons travel, they can be absorbed by electrons that get excited to a high energy state. So as the light propagates, it attenuates, as we discussed with the beer lambert row earlier. But if light travels in a material where you have more electrons excited than in the ground state where you have population inversion, then they can cause stimulated recombination. So one photon comes in and triggers the electron to recombine with the hole. And in the process, the photon gets cloned. It induces the electron to create an identical photon with the same energy, same phase, same direction, same polarization as the incident one. And as these photons keep propagating the material, they get amplified. And that's the principle behind the laser. Right? So that corresponds to what we call gain. As the light propagates the material, that is population inversion, the intensity gets amplified. So this competition between the intentional gain we want to achieve by, in, by injecting electrons and holes in the active region versus the absorption that happens everywhere else tells us uh, about the output power of this laser. And what happens experimentally is that, yeah, we need to consider how the doped gallium nitride, whether it's doped N-type by electrons or doped P-type by holes, uh, can absorb light. Again, this band gap here is wider than uh, the photon energy, so you can't absorb across the band, but only through the free carriers you may have some loss. Um, direct absorption in this case is also weak, because for, for in the case of gallium nitride, there are no whole states to go to. There is a state for electrons, but it's dipole forbidden, so this absorption is very weak. So again, the, the dominant source of loss here that occurs for any photon energy, as you see here, is that due to phonons, right? And if you put this all together, you can also evaluate what is the absorption cross-section, that is the, the optical loss uh, per unit charge for, for your material. And we find that the loss uh, is on the order of here, 10 centimeter minus one. And remember, this is much lower than what you expect in a strong absorber, but because light has to bounce back and forth several times before it gets emitted, this loss can be significant in, inside the laser. And putting it all together, we're able to find what constitutes the dominant source of optical loss in a Blu-ray laser. And that is caused by holes, and in particular holes bound to acceptors. Um, a small uh, parenthesis here is that typically the, the, when we dope a material, we want those donors and acceptors, those that give free holes and free holes, to be within a few millivs close to the bands in order to be thermally 
uh, excited and give us free electrons and free holes. That is true for N-type donors in gallium nitride, such as silicon, but it's not true for P-type dopa, such as magnesium, because the activation energy is 200 millev. And as a result, only a few percent of the magnesium uh, dopants are ionized. Many of the holes do remain the magnesium and they don't contribute to the conductivity. However, they do contribute to the optical loss. Uh, that is, a hole can absorb the photon and go to a lower valence band, or you can think of it conversely, an electron in the valence band can absorb the photon and occupy uh, that magnesium state, even though it's not conducting, it would still cause some optical loss, and that explains the loss we see experimentally in nitrite lasers. Um, I'll be talking about free carriers, of course, uh, in semiconductors, uh, but of course the more famous materials where free carriers occur are metals, right? In particular, uh, optical absorption uh, can occur for metals where the Fermi level crosses the bands. Uh, and this is the work by Anna Brown and others from 2016, where they showed that phonon assisted transitions uh, within the the intraband that crosses the Fermi energy is also an important source for plasma decay in metals. And the equations you see here are very similar to the equation I showed you earlier for uh, phonon assist absorption in, in semiconductors. And I guess so, um, by combining with the direct transitions uh, from interband processes along with phonon assisted and the plasmonic and, and the uh, resistive loss, you can also explain the optical properties of, of metals as well. Uh, and before uh, I, I summarize the, the results, I also want to, uh, to, to advertise an alternative method that you will hear uh, tomorrow by Mario Zacharias, is how to obtain the optical spectra, not in a second order perturbation theory approach, but with first order perturbation theory, where you treat the electron photon interaction first order. However, you, you displace the atoms according to a linear combination of the phonon mode. So you incorporate the phonon perturbation into your starting point, you displace the atoms in a supercell, and then you can do a one-shot calculation for optical absorption. And, and this has many advantages because it avoids a configuous divergence uh, in the equation that we see earlier. As you saw earlier, I was showing data for the region where at, uh, one photon absorption, uh, where, where um, in-depth absorption occurs, but not where direct absorption occurs. And the reason is the equations diverge there. Although recent work by uh, Sabia Tawari and Feliciano's group has shown that this uh, problem is also solved. And you'll hear from his work uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, later this year. Um, the advantage of, of, of the method that you will hear tomorrow though also is that it does not need to consider one year interpolation can be uh, done in a one-step process of the supercell. But more powerfully, it, it describes the temperature dependence of the eigenvalues, the band gaps, and the Urbach tail in one seamless way, where you can have, we can study the region where phonons dominate, the region where direct absorption dominates. You can also put temperature in to see the, the effects on the broadening as well as on the eigenvalues. And that technique can be generalized to consider other functionals. So you can use, for example, hybrid functionals, you can use W techniques, uh, and it can be done in a, in a supercell, it is applicable here. So you'll hear more about this technique tomorrow in, in Marius's talk and can read more about it in his, in his paper, in his publication. And here I also want to share with you uh, with some references. So if you're interested in optics in general, I recommend a book by Mark Fox. And if you want to be particular to, to see more of the derivations of the equations, like the ones we saw today, how to go from uh, atomistic level quantities such as wave functions and matrix elements all the way to optical coefficients, I recommend this uh, great book by Bassani and Pastori Paravicini. And you can read also uh, in the review articles uh, about uh, optics and foreign assisted optics, as well as the publications uh, where we uh, present the results for silicon and dop, dop silicon, and last but not least, the latest version of the EPW code manuscript that you can find on the archive. And with that, I'd like to, to thank uh, 
um, the, the two key developers of the optics module within EPW, uh, Sean and Kyle, that you will meet later today, as of course uh, all the collaborators in the EPW team that have made these calculations possible, and uh, of course the uh, also the collaborators, both theoretical and experimental, that um, participate in this in this research. And of course, thank you for your attention as well. Thank you. Okay, Manos, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have some time for um, uh, 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 questions. So there are several questions mm -hmm. that you need. Of course. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and, and try to answer them. Yes, please, yes. So uh, I see Surat's question that the uh, input power uh, is proportional to a alpha a square, but a is gauge dependent. Um, uh, how, how gauge dependence of input power comes? Um, yeah, um, in the end, the equation is are not gauge dependent. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how on, on the spot. I can't I can't think of how the gauge um, invariance comes in. But but in the, in the end, the answer the a cancels out, and you don't have any effect of the of the gauge in your final answer. So it only depends on microscopic quantities such as wave functions and and eigenvalues and matrix elements. So the the phase ambiguity or gauge ambiguity of a is it does not enter the final equation. And to answer Shushil's question, can you calculate absorption in 2D materials? And the answer is yes. That can also be uh, be accomplished. Um, uh, I, I would uh, point out perhaps um, uh, the lecture by Samuel Ponsa yesterday about um, um, potential issues with interpolating the phonon matrix elements in two dimensions. Otherwise, yeah, the formula should work. But one one catch there is because in 2D materials. Um, uh, the, the, the quantity we discussed earlier, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and refractive index as, are not well defined for 2D materials. So we need to do uh, one more step to calculate the absorbance by multiplying with the thickness of your simulation cell. And you get what is the percent, the probability that a, a photon cross my 2D material can be absorbed or not. That is the famous uh, value of about 2% for, for graphene. Um, can you study a mission like for luminescent spectral materials also with EPWG? And the answer is yes. Um, in fact, um, I can point to a recent paper in the in, in the comments where we we invoked the absorption spectra and do the uh, appropriate transformation using the um, Einstein relations to convert the absorption spectrum to an emission spectrum um, using causality. And, and that is a, also a powerful way to convert uh, absorption to emission. Um, uh, a good detail balance. Uh, Antonia's question, uh, uh, why is the absorption cross-section has a deviation from linearity at, at low photon? Uh, I suppose, mean, uh, uh, is it a, a low, uh, low photon wavelengths? So um, I'm not sure if you mean low photon energy or low, wa low wavelengths or long wavelengths. So I can, I can try to answer both ways. So at, um, when you go to high energies, uh, that's where the, the details of the band structure matter. That's when, the energy scale is such that you transition to bands that deviate from simple models like parabolas and so on. So you have to take into account the details of the band structure. At the other extreme, when you go to very long wavelengths, that's another place where one needs to be careful because that's where the phonons themselves come in. or well, the energy goes directly to the phonons and not to the electrons. So we need to consider the optical response by the phonons and, and, and we see peaks from the uh, LO and the TO modes, et cetera. Um, so, uh, from Sumhazmita's uh, question, can we start the charge carrier dynamics in semiconductor at the interface device using APW code? Um, you should be able to. Uh, this, is, this is also in combination with the transport routines. So, we're uh, developing, uh, of course, the code does have the linear response techniques, but we're currently working on understanding the high field transport and the dynamics of carriers uh, beyond the uh, as you make equilibrium distribution so that that can also happen uh, if you're interested in uh, interface effects at a longer time scales perhaps you can uh, obtain epsilon epsilon 2 for the two materials and and, and use some more empirical modeling to, to study effects such as uh, surface plasmons etc but uh, there may be some creative ways to use epw in its current form to to obtain some physical insights into interfaces uh, Sort of question again, can it be possible to study foreign assisted optical absorption in the general semiconductors uh, with Fermi levels inside the band? And the answer is yes. Uh, the only thing we need to consider here is the Fermi occupations. And so yeah, as long as they are in the band, you should be able uh, to do that. Um, 
Yeah, and the code um, should allow you to, to place the family levels within the bands. And you should also take into account the Pauli exclusion principle so that you don't transition from an occupied to an empty state. And, and we should, this is called the Bernstein Moss shift, where the band gap apparently increases in top semiconductors. Um, another question from Megdi. Before plotting the tau plot for experimental data, yeah, what is the fundamental idea to get confirmation about the exponent values that determine the, the gap type? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Like, in order to be able to determine whether the gap is direct or indirect, I would say the, the biggest challenge experimentally is to get good quality samples. Because okay. one thing that will happen is if you have a band gap and the sample is it has lots of defects, not very pure quality, you'll get a very long tail below the band gap. You won't get this sharp transition between absorption and, and, and transparency, right? You won't get a sharp onset. And so this long exponential tail may hide what's the true nature of the band gap. So once you have good quality samples, the, the TAC plot is a, is a genuine analysis. Another way to tell whether the gap is indirect or not, if it's direct, is the presence of luminescence. It's another sign that the gap is direct. Although um, there are cases in materials like silicon carbide or boron nitride that do emit light, even though their band gap is indirect. So, so this notion that light emission only happens in direct gap materials is also not always true. Uh, through phonons, uh, materials with indirect band gaps can luminesce. And, I mentioned earlier silicon carbide in this lecture. In fact, silicon carbide is the first known material that we know to electroluminance, where you apply voltage and light comes out. This is the very first recording of this, of this effect, even though its band gap is, is indirect. Um, yes, Mukesh um, question at page 32, you plotted the light spectrum at advanced action two places, but the energy looks between, um, so it's a more specific question. So let me go back to slide 32. Uh, oops, oops, sorry. Sorry for that. Um, all right, here. Um, all right, so, so why, where we show photons in two places was one part is where electrons can go, right? So if an electron starts at the bottom of the band and absorbs red photons, it will go here. If that those green photons go there, then violet photons goes here. The opposite is true for holes. A hole at the top of the band, if it absorbs red photons, can go to any of these bands within the red band. You can think of it the opposite way. If, it, if there's an electron here, we can absorb a red photon and make it to the top of the various band where there are empty states because of the holes. So this is one way to where we have absorption both ways, both by the electrons and for the holes. Uh, so so yeah, and, and both need to be considered if you have uh, whether it's n-type or p-type materials. Uh, um, another question for Peyo: uh, How about nonlinear optics? Um, yes, that's a great question as well. Um, we do expect to also see two photon photon assist absorption, and uh, particularly for silicon. Um, you can think between the regions where if you need two photons to cross a direct band gap, um, you also think about what is the spectral region where you need two photons plus one photon, two photons plus one phonon to make it across the indirect band gap. So that is also uh, possible. Um, so yeah, that, that's also an effect that we can uh, we, we can we can uh, potentially investigate. Um, uh, for a uh, question for Prachi uh, about uh, gold nano clusters, we call absorption due to plasmonic effect. Um, yeah, so, so that's another great question. So depending on the size of the of the clusters, you, you if the clusters are large enough so you don't get quantum confinement effects, you can potentially approximate the uh, the coefficients with those of the bulk material. Uh, and of course, do uh, optics at a nanoscale. But if the cluster size is at the atomic level, then you also need to consider quantum effects such as confinement, surface effects, and modification of the wave functions. Um, and also uh, from uh, Bulumoni, a question Can you explain the high peaks obtained for imaginary electric function at zero in metals? Yes, so in metals, the electric function tends to infinity as the uh, as the wavelength goes to zero, and that's because electric fields cannot exist in metals, right? They, they, 
they can travel at the static limit. Metals have perfect shielding, and that's why you can sustain an electric field, and that's why the electric function goes to, to, to zero. And another question by Medi: if you want to compare the x electron spectra near 100 EV, um, how do I approach it? Yeah, so if you're looking at X-ray spectra, that, that's where the core electrons come in. That's where you need to, to, to go beyond the pseudo-potential approximation. Also consider those inner states that, that, that tend to not participate in chemistry, uh, but they, they do appear in X-ray and they provide the signature for the elements in your material. Um, uh, I, I don't think you can approach all these techniques, but um, the, the, certain codes in the literature you can take care of that. Now, I'll be happy to point out some if you if you can't find any. But I would approach. I would start with Carmen Espresso first before um, um, before uh, uh, to, to find answers to your question uh, about the lifetime of the excited state. Yeah, the lifetime of the excited state would be. Uh, in, there are many lifetimes. One question you may ask is how long does it an electron take to, to leave that particular state by emitting a phonon? And that is the energy of the, the self-energy of the electron due to electron phonon coupling, right? That's the energy it takes to emit one phonon. Another question can, you can think of is once you excite the electron, how long it takes to emit all the phonon it needs to go to the bottom of the band, and that is called the energy relaxation time, which involves a cascade of many phonon effects. So depending on the experiment, you need to use one or the other. And if it's transport experiment, you also need to know the momentum relaxation time. So to so the of the experiment, you would need to invoke a different lifetime. So, um, but, but, but yeah, the, the EPW code can calculate all of these lifetimes and you can uh, compare with the right experiment. And last but not least, uh, how can one can calculate temperature dependent absorption? So the temperature comes in, in two places. One, it comes in the phonon occupation numbers. Um, even zero temperature, you have zero point effects, but at high temperature, you have more and more phonons. But um, another question uh, can come in is uh, phonons can also change the band structure, right? As you see here, the, the band gap tends to reduce with temperature, the spectra tend to broaden. So, so all of those can, can, can be factored in uh, with the methods here. So there, uh, you can try to approach them with perturbation theory. You can try uh, with a method by Zacharias and Justine that you see here, and you from, from Zacharias and uh, Marius is talk tomorrow. So yeah, there, we have a few choices on that depending on your problem, one may be more appropriate than the other. And, and last, can, can you directly calculate plasma decay? Um, you, you need to do a transformation, I think. You need, to, once, you in, once you have, the phonon frequency, and the, the, or here the imaginary epsilon for the given frequency, you can convert it to a loss function. Yeah, so this way, um, for specific, um, was specific Q, uh, I'm not sure, that, that seems more like an electron self energy. Perhaps you'll hear about it in the GW talk later in the week, because that seems to be more like a, an electron self energy due, due to electron electron interactions, but the, the the APW code can definitely take into account the uh, uh, self energy due to electron phonon interaction. So, depending on the physics that comes in, you you may need a different different approach. Okay. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Thank you, Manas, for taking all of these questions. That was impressive. Uh, so, everybody, um, this is the end of the uh, theory section. Uh, so, we're going to take a break now, and then we reconvene uh, for uh, the tutorials that will start at um, uh, 10.30 uh, Pacific time, okay? So they start in about like 37 minutes. Uh, if you want to start logging in, probably we will open the Zoom link in about 10 minutes, okay? Uh, if you have any questions. So thanks again to the speakers of this morning session and see you in a bit.